And uh, this morning, for those who were there, we talked about the big one. We talked about marriage, that special, most close bond between a man and a woman, lifelong relationship. The key, uh, and we saw this morning that that, that relationship really uh, reflects what God is doing in the world at a mega level. That's really exciting. But tonight, we're talking about something very different, aren't we? We're talking about singleness. And in some ways, singleness is kind of like the opposite of marriage, isn't it? Well, by definition, if you're not married, you're single. And so all the good things that we see in a marriage, in singleness, we don't have those good things. We don't have that most special bond between two people that's lifelong, covenanted, and all the blessings that go with that. And singleness can be, let's be honest, tough. It can be tough. Because not being in a marriage means that, to some degree, in parts of your life at least, you are alone. And being alone can be really difficult. Loneliness can be really deeply difficult. It sounds a bit kind of like not a big deal, oh, I was a bit lonely. But no, no, if you're a single person, you may well know how hard that loneliness can be. So I think it's really good for us to acknowledge that and admit that, that being single can be tough. But here's the interesting thing. As we turn to the scriptures, uh, we might think, well, since our own experience of being single and, and being lonely is, is not always great, and since the Bible talks so positively about marriage, do we expect to find that the Bible will not talk so well about singleness? You know, if marriage is fantastic then maybe the Bible says, oh, on singleness, well, it ain't so great. The surprising thing, the really surprising thing is the Bible doesn't say that. For all that it holds marriage up as that great special bond between a man and a woman for life and really a paradigm for us understanding what God is doing in his world, it doesn't say not being married is bad. And that's kind of quite surprising. We go back to Genesis chapter 2, we looked at it this morning, and we read in Genesis chapter 2, 18, it is not good for man to be alone. But as we continue through the Bible, read through the whole story of the Scriptures, we see that that develops. And it's true, it's, it's not good for man to be alone. But as we come particularly to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, our understanding of singleness is radically transformed. And the Apostle Paul will teach us the same thing as well. So we're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture tonight and see what I think is really unexpected, but actually really quite an encouraging way to think about being single. We're going to look at Matthew, Matthew's Gospel and chapter 19. You might know Matthew 19 because this is a part of the Scripture where Jesus talks at some length about divorce. Uh, He's been uh, asked about this and gives his response about divorce. But he says more in this chapter about relationships than just about divorce. Uh, Jesus has had this uh, discussion about divorce, and he says divorce is actually really bad, and only in a certain circumstance could divorce be considered uh, something that's possible. And uh, then you get to verses 10 through to 12, and this is how the disciples respond to Jesus setting an incredibly high bar on marriage and really saying divorce is, is not really an option. The disciples then respond this way. I'm going to read Matthew 19, verses 10 to 12. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who's able to receive this, receive it. The disciples respond to Jesus, if marriage is so inviolable, if you can't really just ditch your wife, God, it'd be better not to be married, wouldn't it? Now, I just want to say, we pick on the disciples a lot, and I'm going to join in that celebrated tradition right now, (laughs) and say, if these guys are here saying, 
if I've got to be married and I can't just get divorced for whatever reason, I think they're probably guys that you don't want to be married to in the first place, frankly. But they're saying something. The disciples, I think, are saying something that they think is absurd. They're saying something that they think is just ridiculous. They're saying that if you're being this serious about marriage, Jesus, then maybe we just forget the whole idea of marriage and stay single. And they're saying that kind of mocking. I think it's a, it's a ridiculous idea, but this is where you're leading us, Jesus, to this ridiculous idea that people should not be married. It's better than, in that case, to be single. Because you see, at the time, most people in Jesus' day uh, would have seen marriage as very much the natural place where people end up as they move through their young adult years. It was a very natural and a very common ideal. The disciples are really saying, Jesus, this is what happens, right? Guys grow up, they meet women, women grow up, they meet guys, man leaves his father and mother, clings to his life, they become one flesh, this is the pattern of the world, this is how it is. People get married, it's the social norm. You say marriage has got to be taken that seriously, though. Maybe we should stay single. And Jesus, actually, being Jesus, runs with the idea. He runs with the idea. He says, oh, yeah, actually, being single, not such a bad thing after all. Which really, I take it, is not what they expected. They expected him to say, no, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm not saying stay single. But he says, no, maybe staying singleness is something we should think about. Now, again, this is seriously different to anything that they would have heard before. Marriage was the standard. Marriage was just what you did when you grew up and you got older. Sometimes, many times, the marriages would have been arranged. So it didn't matter about meeting the right person, falling in love and all that sort of stuff. Marriage was just the path that was set for you. And the truth is, that actually was pretty much the case for Western society up until the 1960s and the sexual revolution. Up until the 1960s, most people grew up and expected, we'll get married. And there'd be various introductions that your parents might arrange, and some of them be embarrassing, but some of them might work out. But most people would end up getting married. In the 1960s, and the sexual revolution, and the time that followed that, suddenly people decided, we don't need to be married. And there was a bunch of reasons why people thought, we don't need marriage anymore. Why this whole idea of marriage started being uh, dismissed by society. The first was, of course, people suddenly grabbed onto the idea that you don't need to be married to have sex. Suddenly you think, hey, well, you can just have sex and not be married. It's fine. There's, that really means there's one less reason to get married. People will think, you don't need to be tied down. You can be free. You know, peace, love, hippie child, off you go and just wander the earth freely. You don't need to be tied down to another person. Why would you do that? Some people think actually slightly differently. They think we don't need marriage to seal a long-term relationship. So I've got friends like this. You might have friends like this as well who say we love each other very, very, very much. Why do we need to get married to prove it to anyone? You know, marriage, we don't need that marriage to kind of say that we're in love. We, we don't need some kind of church or state to validate our relationship. And so they don't get married out of principle. Uh, and there are some people for whom... Uh, they, they see marriage actually as part of an oppressive culture. You know, if you marry, you're really buying into a system that uh, oppresses particularly women and, and is a structural evil, and we should reject marriage. So there's a whole lot of reasons that kind of started in the 60s and carried through to today why less and less people get married. But these are not the reasons that Jesus put forward to his disciples. When the disciples respond to Jesus' strict teaching on divorce, they say, well, then maybe it's better not to get married, saying it as an absurd statement. And Jesus says, yeah, maybe it is better not to get married. Let me give you three ways that that might happen. And we saw them in verse 12. Three reasons that a person might not get married. Now, I just want to say here, guys, you might as well cross your legs and just take a deep breath because we're going to talk about something that is uncomfortable. We're going to talk about what it means to be a eunuch. Jesus used this language in verse 12. It's kind of odd language. We don't really, eunuch doesn't come up much in conversation these days, does it? But Jesus talks about eunuchs and people who are eunuchs. Now, what is a eunuch? 
A eunuch is a man who has been castrated. What does castrated mean? Imagine a knife. <laughs> and imagine... You get the picture. A eunuch is a man who's been castrated. And what that means is a eunuch is a man who has no sexual capacity, unable to have sex, and no sexual desire that's been removed. And they were actually very important people in the ancient world. You think that sounds terrible, and there's something profoundly terrible about it, but they're actually very important people. Why was a eunuch an important person? Because they were safe. They were safe people. You could trust a eunuch with women, implicitly. And so it would often be that eunuchs would guard the harems of uh, various rulers. Uh, these men who kept m women would have them protected by eunuchs because they knew the eunuchs not going to do anything to them. Or a, a eunuch might be in, in a position where he has to deal with very important women and you think, well, we don't want those women uh, in any way under any kind of sexual threat, uh, so the fact that he's a eunuch makes him safe. This is exactly what we see, of course, in Acts chapter 8. Read the book of Acts chapter 8. Philip, who's one of the, the seven who's set apart in the start of Acts chapter 6, uh, Philip meets a guy on the road from Jerusalem down to Gaza, and he is an Ethiopian eunuch. And he's a very high official. In fact, he is the treasurer of Ethiopia. And he's a treasurer under a queen. The queen has this man as her treasurer. And the thing about him is, he's safe. He could go in and have private conferences with the queen and talk about all the money and all the business of the state, and no one would have any concern that she'd be at any risk or any funny business was going on. So eunuchs were actually considered to be important servants. And sometimes important servants of very significant leaders. Jesus says there are three ways that someone might become a eunuch. The first way, this is all in verse 12. There are eunuchs who have been so from birth. I take it what Jesus is talking about here is there are some men who are born uh, with some kind of um, uh, physical issue, some kind of deformity, who knows, uh, and for whatever reason, basically they don't have the bits, um, they're unable to be involved in sexual activity, that's just part of the way they're born, there's some kind of birth defect there. No sex, no marriage. There are others who, again, verse 12, have been made eunuchs by others. And, and this is probably the uh, more well-known one. Men who have been castrated so that they can serve. Perhaps this was the Ethiopian eunuch story. Uh, that he was going to be taken into the service of the queen, and so he was made a eunuch by others. Uh, perhaps this happened to actually young boys who were slaves or servants in households so that when they grew up, they could become those officials serving as eunuchs. But then Jesus said something quite unexpected. Verse, uh, again, verse uh, 12, the third point. He says, There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs. Now, what does that mean? I don't think it means actually the procedure. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about. But I think he's talking about functionally. There are... Uh, people who have decided not to have sexual activity as part of their life. People who have decided to functionally be, for all intents and purposes, like eunuchs. People who never have sexual relationships, and therefore, of course, uh, thinking in first century, think therefore never get married, uh, because they've done that, they've made that decision for themselves. Now, this in our culture, I think, is absurd. The idea that someone would choose voluntarily to have a sexless life. It's, in our culture, it's just totally unthinkable. Because we think precisely the opposite. Our culture says, you should get as much sex as you possibly can. Jesus says there are some who will choose to have sexless lives. You know, there was a film a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. It was a film called The 40-Year-Old Virgin. 
You know this film? Kind of doesn't matter if you don't know it. You know that in our culture, the title of that film tells you it's a comedy. It has to be a comedy. Because it's just laughable that there could be a 40-year-old virgin. That's just ridiculous. It's hilarious. And so, in our culture, that's exactly right. Sex is everything. To voluntarily choose not to have sex would just seem ridiculous. And I think that's really the parallel that we need to be seeing. Please understand, when we're talking here about eunuchs and not being able to have sex, sex is so integral to marriage, it's, it's the equivalent of someone saying, I choose never to get married. I choose never to have sex in my life. How, why would you do that? Why would anyone do that? Why would you make that decision? You would only make that decision if there was something better than sex, something better than marriage. Again, that's unthinkable. In our culture, what, what could that possibly be? Is anything better than sex? Could anything be better in relational terms than marriage? Well, Jesus says, there's a reason you do this. And the reason must be pointing to something better. Let's finish verse 12. There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Some people have voluntarily chosen to be functionally like eunuchs, have given away that, uh, the opportunity of having sex in their life and, and therefore uh, of getting married, if you believe that sex belongs in marriage, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? What does that mean? Does that mean you'll just be purer if you don't have a sex life? Like is, some people think this, right? Some people think that sex is kind of sort of dirty and a bit... Uh, and if you want to really be holy and clean and pure, then you shouldn't have sex. So, you know, choose not to have sex, choose not to get married. That's not what Jesus is talking about. And in fact, as you read through the Scriptures, that can't be right because sex is not seen as something that makes people dirty except in the wrong contexts. Actually, sex in marriage is a great gift. And the Apostle Paul, by the way, says, if you're married, you should get on the job. It's not something that you should be reserved about. 1 Corinthians 7, we'll look at a bit more of that in a minute. So that's not right. So what's going on? If it's not just about, I decide not to have sex, and if I think sex belongs in marriage, that means I decide not to get married for the sake of the kingdom. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? Well, let's turn up that chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and see what the Apostle Paul can tell us about it. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 is talking about marriage and talking about uh, various matters to do with marriage. And as well as saying, if you're married, husbands and wives should be meeting each other's sexual needs, uh, only stopping to pray, uh, but apart from that, shouldn't be stopping. Um, <laughs> In addition to that, he says this really interesting thing, which I think couples right on the back of what Jesus is talking about, that some people will choose to be abstinent for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And he says it in verses 32 through to 35. I don't want to read that out. So 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 to 35. It says this. Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. It's very interesting here because... Paul is not giving any command or instruction. He's not saying this is what you should do and what you shouldn't do. He's giving an opinion. He makes it very clear. Uh, verse 35, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint on you. Uh, th that is, Paul is not saying, I'm not telling you that you have to not get married. He's saying, I'm just giving you a view that might be helpful as you consider what you're going to do with your life. It's not that marriage is bad. 
It's not that there's anything wrong with marriage. There's not anything wrong with sex in marriage. Paul says precisely the opposite. But it's simply this. People who are unmarried have more time, more energy, for single-minded, single-hearted devotion to the Lord. It's just a straightforward fact of life. If you're married, you, of course, have to give attention to your spouse. Of course you do. You have to be worried about the things they're worried about. You have to be concerned and caring to look after them. But if you're not, you don't. Your attentions are undivided and can be solely focused on the Lord and your devotion to Him. Please note, this is not a concession prize. It's not, well, if you can't get married... I guess you could, you know, devote yourself to the Lord. That's something. No, 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 no. Paul's saying this is a good thing. If you're married, in fact, you'll be distracted from your devotion to the Lord. Rightly so, because you must attend to your marriage. But if you're not married, you have the opportunity to be single-hearted, single-mindedly focused on the Lord. And that's a great thing. That's a great thing. Here's the interesting thing, isn't it? Paul chose this life, and so did Jesus. So did Jesus. When Jesus was talking about being a eunuch, and some people choosing to be a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, he was talking about himself as well, wasn't he? This is the life he's chosen, to not be married for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So choosing to be single, choosing not to have the sex life that comes with marriage is not a concession prize. It's actually very closely following in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ and his Apostle Paul. I have to say, um, I know some single people who have done exactly this. Uh, I have uh, a mentor, a guy who I meet with regularly, and mentor me in the faith. Um, another uh, minister who's been a very significant guy in my life, a pastor who's been a significant uh, influence on me, and they're both single men. And they have incredible ministries, doing things that take them to all parts of the world, and I mean all parts of the world. One of them now is on something like his 37th visit to Burma, uh, as well as everywhere else he goes. And they are frankly things that these guys could not do if they were married. They couldn't do them if they were married. They have incredible ministries serving the Lord. And part of the reason they can have these ministries is because they're free from a marriage. These are two of the guys I hold in the highest esteem in my own Christian walk. Now we might say, look, okay, that, that all makes sense. I get it. It adds up. I see what's going on. Yes, if I'm, if I'm not married, then I have more time to give to the Lord. And okay, I get that. But Paul is talking about something voluntary, isn't he? He's saying you might make this decision. You might choose this way, but you don't have to. So the elephant in the room is, what if I'm single, but I don't want to be single? What if I'm single, but that's actually not, I'd prefer to be married. Uh, Paul says I don't have to be single, and I'd, I'd, I'd rather not be, actually. I'd, I'd rather be married. What do people do who find themselves in that category? Well, the first thing I, I want to say to this is we just need to be careful about how much we identify with our relational status. It is right, of course, if you're married, to own the fact that you're married in a one flesh relationship, and it's right if you're single to acknowledge that you're single. But, you know, th these things aren't always as fixed as we seem, as, as they seem. Uh, some people who are single and don't want to be actually eventually do get married. Even though for some of them it might be a long time after they had hoped, it still comes. So it's not a helpful mindset to think I'm lifelong single because you just never know what might be down the path. And the flip side of that is married people don't know how long they're going to be married either. And I say that because in many cases, most cases, one spouse will die before the other. And the remaining spouse will return to being single again. And in some cases, people can be single for decades after the death of their spouse. And you think, 
oh, yeah, but you're talking about, you know, right down the other end when I'm, you know, 150 years old, all that sort of stuff. Uh, no. I was married in 1997 when I was 23 years old. Uh, and five years later, my wife died. So I then went back to being single. That's not what I expected. So it's not particularly helpful to say, I'm in a category that's rock solid and fixed, because if you're single, you might get married. And uh, after me being single for the second time, I've now remarried and I'm married for the second time. But I don't know how long this will last, and presumably one of my wife or I will die first and one of us will be single again. So while I do want us to own where we are in life, I also want us to recognise that there are seasons and times and things change. And we need to be conscious that where we are today might not be where we are. And so let's not get too either fixated or anxious, but trust the Lord for each day as it comes. It's still the case, though, even having said that, even having said that circumstances can and do change, it's still the case that some people who are single don't enjoy being single and would rather not be single. Well, let me give you two ideas that may be helpful, may be helpful if you're in that situation. Uh, one is you could be proactive in looking for a spouse. Now, this is not my own idea. This is the idea of uh, a good friend of mine. It came from his wife. Now, this is a couple who got married quite late. So that they've been single quite a long time and past the kind of first wave of marriage when uh, lots of people, their friends got married and got married late. And his wife, I'm going to call her Kerry, that's not her name, but I'm going to call her Kerry. Uh, she'd been through this uh, period of not being married when all her friends were and wanted to be married. And you know what she decided? It's kind of radical. She decided, I'm going to be proactive about this. What does that mean? That means she drew some very close Christian friends around her, some women who were her close friends, and she said, I want to be married. And I want you to pray for me that I would find a good man to be married to. And I'm going to go looking, and I want you to keep me accountable. And she made a list of what she was looking for in a man. She wanted a faithful Christian believer and whatever other things she was looking for. And then she thought, where are those men likely to be? <laughs> and she went to those things. Sunday night, Sunday night church. <laughs> they weren't at her Sunday night church. So she went to other places. Uh, and anyway, they ended up meeting at some, they're both nerds, right? He's, my, he's a really good friend of mine, but he's like an associate professor of physics, right? They're nerds. They met at some, some lecture series, uh, and it was a lecture series that had been put on by Christians, and they met, uh, and she was proactive in introducing herself to him because he was a single guy. She had her friends keeping her accountable, so this wasn't uh, kind of in a dangerous space, and basically was proactive in saying, I'd like to pursue a relationship. And now they're married and they're a fantastic couple. It's kind of not what we do. We like the rom-com, don't we? We like the idea that somehow we'll just kind of be walking out of a, a shopping centre and trip over something and someone will bend down and pick it up and as they oh, will meet eyes and it'll be, oh, that's so... It'll just, it'll just happen. It'll just happen by accident. It'll just be a beautiful accident. Well, if it is a beautiful accident, that's great. But if it's not a beautiful accident, it could be a beautiful strategy. <laughs> and for this friend, Amen. for this friend, that's exactly what she did. Kerry went out, had a strategy, kept herself accountable, looked for a good Christian guy, found him, and they got married. You could do that. You could do that with trusted friends at your side. The second thing that you could do, actually, though, is trust God for where you are now. Trust God for where you are now. If you today are someone who is single, or you know someone who's single, and, and, and that's not the situation, the preferred situation, there might be just a, a, an interesting question to ask. You think, I'm single, or my friend's single, but prefer not to be. Why has God kept me single at this point? It's not an accident. He's the sovereign Lord of the universe. My life is under his control. Why has he kept me single at this point? And then you might think of Jesus' words. You might think of Paul's words. Perhaps it's because there's particular kingdom service he wants me to engage in that I couldn't do if I was married. 
wonder if that could be the case. Maybe it is. And so maybe a thing to do is to say, have a stop and a think about what you could possibly do as a ministry for the Lord that you really couldn't do if you were married. Brainstorm that. What is it that that I could now do that I couldn't do with a spouse? Maybe that's the reason God hasn't yet given you a spouse because he's got a work like that for you to do. And take it to your friends and people you trust and pray with them. And it might be radical. It might be outrageous. That's kind of the sort of thing God does. Radical and outrageous things. A woman at my old church uh, was not married and desperately wanted to be. And she was unashamed about that. She was Greek and very effusive and loved uh, playing up to her cultural heritage. So she was tell people that she wanted to be married. But not being married, she thought, well, what can I do then to serve the Lord? Next thing we hear, she's on a plane to Afghanistan, serving there. Couldn't do that with a husband and kids, but she could at that stage of life. And then a few years later, God said, you've done your stint there, it's time to get married, and provided a husband for her. (laughs) So there's two things. You could be proactive. You could think, what has God got for me now in this season of life that I couldn't have in another season of life? But even as you think about those things, I think it's really critical that we be honest. We must be honest. And we must not pretend that singleness is easy if we find it hard. We really need to make sure that we continue prioritizing our relationship with God, entrusting ourselves to faithful friends, and being honest about our situation. And I want to say that the church family can do something that no one else can do. They can love us like no one else can love us. And I want to say that we should be looking out for each other. And I want to say that single people should be looking out for each other. But more than that, I want to say married people should be looking out for single people. And single people should be looking out for married people. And we should be blessing each other and helping each other in our needs. And it might just well be that if you're a single person, you've got some great things to offer to married couples. You might be able to say to a married couple who are just burnt out with their kids and exhausted and totally uh, got no fuel in the tank, you might say, hey, I'm babysitting tonight and you guys are out to dinner. Wow. And when they go out to dinner, you might even clean the kitchen for them and they come back and go, wow. You could bless them (laughs) as a single person. But if you're a married couple, you might be saying to your single friend, well, sorry, you're eating at our place this week. And in fact, you're eating at our place every Thursday because really you're part of our family. And welcoming them in, not just as a kind of formal guest with the white linen, but saying, you know, here's a key to the front door. Feel free to get a drink out of the fridge, watch something on telly, we're part of your family. You see, we can love and serve and look after each other, even if we're not in the same place as each other. And those relationships actually are some of the most beautiful relationships you'll come across, where people care for and love people who are at a different stage in life to themselves. So if you struggle with being single... I want to encourage you to let people know that. And I want to encourage you to look out for each other. And if you're married, I want, I, I, I'm married, I'd love to encourage you to look out for your single friends and love them as part of the extended family, which they are. And I want to finish just then by saying, we must remember, whether we're single or married, none of us is missing out on the real marriage. None of us is missing out on the real marriage. We spoke about this this morning. We spoke about the real marriage. The real marriage is between the Lord Jesus and his church. He's the bridegroom and we're the bride. And if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus on the last day, you will be part of the real marriage. And it will be more glorious than any worldly wedding you could be part of. And it'll be a relationship better than any marriage you've ever seen. And you will be part of it. So even if you're missing out at some level on a a human relationship, You are not missing out on the ultimate relationship. Set your eyes on him. He will satisfy you more than any other person, any other relationship ever could. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of singleness, the freedom to serve you unencumbered and in exciting ways that perhaps we can't when we're married and have children and so on. We do know it's a challenge to be single. 
We do know that it's hard not to have the intimacy that comes with a marriage. And yet we trust that you are enough and we trust that you've given us to each other to look after each other and care for each other. And we also know that you know where our lives are going and, and we don't. And please uh, don't let us write a script for ourselves that you haven't written. We thank you for all the gifts of relationships that we enjoy. And we pray that we would see them as you see them. And in all of them, married or single, uh, we would seek first and foremost to honor you and to glorify you, the Lord of all relationships, the Lord of all. Amen. Thank you.